Okay. Us. Okay. So somebody said the chapter nine slides are not working, but the chapters eight eight are. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go to the chapter eight slides. These are PowerPoint, so it's going to download them. And if you wanted to do the chapter eight worksheets. You guys have these, right? These are some of the ones that I gave you. Yeah. They are one, two pages. And most of them are plugging numbers into G-Power. So that's how um, involved we're gonna be. Okay. This is not set to, this isn't set to work yet. Okay, the power and effect size. So lots of quotes by Cohen. So just to review, so because we're going to go over power first, this is a confusion matrix. We haven't seen this. You read about it in the book, but we haven't talked about it in class. Okay, I gave a workshop on this the last two Mondays, so I'm confusing what I told you and what I told them. No, I think Jeremy. Yes, Jeremy shows. Oh, so we so we didn't talk about type because you talked about type one and type two errors. Yeah. Okay, great. So this is, I usually do it reverse, but here the true state of nature is on the side. So this is the thing we don't know. And we have a hypothesis. Now, this is talking about the null hypothesis here. Because we always conduct our statistical test as based on the null hypothesis. So either the null hypothesis is really true, and there's nothing going on, or the null hypothesis is false, and there is an effect fine. And then when we run our test, we make some conclusion. And accepting a true hypothesis, failing to reject when there's nothing going on, that's a good thing to do. And rejecting the null hypothesis when it's false, that's a good thing to do. Alpha, this is the 0.05, this is the chance that we reject a true null hypothesis. And this red box is for beta, that we, it's the probability that we accept a false hypothesis. So I told you before that there's some push and pull between these make one super, super small, it kind of tends to inflate the other with the same, given the same sample size. So, this is where it comes, this is where pow, why I showed you that. Power, when we talk about the power of a test, is the probability that we correctly reject a false null hypothesis. So usually we're doing a test because we think the null hypothesis is false. So if that is really the case, What's the chance that we really do establish that fact? And so this is one minus beta. So if we say that beta is 0.2, then the power is 0.8 or 80%. We usually talk about power in terms of percentages. So most funding agencies like the National Institute of Health and um, National Institute of Science, most of these national institutes if they put out funding calls to give grants to do research, they almost always want to see a power analysis that shows that your samples is big enough to have 80% power. Meaning that if your idea is true, meaning the null hypothesis is false, you have an 80% chance of detecting that effect and it's saying it's statistically significant. 80% doesn't sound that high, but that's their usually their funding requirement. Um, some situations require higher, like 90%. We did a, I did a registered report with Dave Bolton in the kinesiology department here and with Cortex Journal, and we had to have 90% power. Has anyone heard of a registered report before? This is basically, you write your paper before you collect your data. So you do the lit review and the background, and then you talk about the measures, and what, and the power analysis and say what, so say what sample size you're going to get and then you detail what statistical analysis you're going to do. So you write everything but the results of the analysis because you can't do it because you don't have the data yet and the conclusions and takeaways. And you submit that first part of the article to the journal. And if they sign off on it, except that first part, they guarantee they will publish the results even if they're not statistically significant. 
was, you're smiling, why? It's very strange. <laughs> it's strange because this is not the way research has been done in the past. How has research been done in the past? How do you get published? You get a significant <laughs> result, you find a sexy p-value less than 0.05, and then someone wants to publish it. What happens if you do your result and it's not statistically significant? What's your chance of getting published? Much, much lower. But is it important to know what doesn't cause cancer? Is it important to know what doesn't work with autistic children reading? The doesn't work and doesn't make a difference is just important as the important, but journals have gotten in, it's just not as exciting, I think, a lot of times to publish non-significant results, and that's called publication bias. And so lots of people end up doing the same research because they say, oh, no one's looked at this, when in reality, people have looked at it, and it's been a dead end, but they didn't get it published, so somebody else goes looking at that same thing, and they find a dead end. And then when you try to do meta-analysis, you only get the most exciting results to combine, not the kind of so-so results to combine. So registered reports, I bring them up because if a journal is guaranteeing they're gonna publish your results before they know what your results are, they want you to be well-powered. And so one of the things is they require 90% power on a lot of them. And, and this registered reports are a new way about going about getting published and it, I think you're going to see it a lot more. It's going to be, it is becoming more popular of an idea and a lot more journals are having that option. So, a little bit of more background and lingo. So when we, after we collect data, when we get to like data, we run and calculate a test statistic. And that could be a Z-score or a T-score or we introduce kind of F a little bit like with the pink test. And that's going to give us a p-value, that observed p-value. And we're going to be able to calculate an effect size once we have our data in hand, how big the effect was in your sample. And you can collect or compute what's called observed power. Sometimes it's called post hoc power or retrospective power. It's the power that we, this data gave you to detect the effect that is in this data, which Power after you get your data is going to tell you the same thing the p value is going to tell you. I'll show you an example in a minute. So that's when we are once we have our data in hand. But before we get our data, what well, we can do a power analysis. This is important if you're thinking about doing any proposal for a thesis, a dissertation, for a grant, for IRB. Who thinks that might be you in the future? Every single one of you, that's why you're here, right? Every one of you are going to have to do a thesis, a dissertation, an IRB form, or a grant, right? or all of the above, multiple times. You think you're going to be a professor. Anyway, power, this is what we, the power we would observe given a certain effect size, an alpha, and a sample size. The effect size is how big we expect the effect to be, or how big we want to be able to detect, how small of an effect we want to be able to detect, what effect size we think will be there, what effect size is meaningful in the realm of our research with our variables on our population. The test statistic is the cutoff point that would go with that effect size. The p-value, instead of stating the p-value, we usually set an alpha level, and usually what's our default? 0.05. So these pieces, what do you notice about these four pieces for calculating a power analysis and um, analyzing collected data? What do you notice about the four pieces? They're the same four pieces. Here, we calculate them based on the data. Here, we have to set them before we get started. Now, these are like the ingredients for the recipe. And the recipe you use depends on the analysis you use. Power analysis for one sample p-test is going to have a different formula than power analysis for a independent two groups analysis. It's going to be a different formula or different recipe than a power analysis for a independent group ANOVA, which is going to be different than a repeated measures ANOVA, which is going to be different than linear regression. So every kind of statistical test, the test is the recipe 
And these four things are the ingredients that go into the recipe. Now, it's a mathematical equation. What do we know about a mathematical equation that has four letters in it, four variables? If I know three, three you can find the missing one. As long as you know three, you can find the four. So power analysis, usually, most commonly, people do power analysis to find out what sample size I should go get. But you can do a power analysis for other ingredients. Sometimes we are limited. Let's see, have you ever been limited by this? Time, money, resources, availability of participants because it's something that's rare in your geographical location. Sometimes we have limitations on our sample size. So sometimes we have the sample size set in stone. So maybe we want to know what effect size could we find if we're locked into our sample size. It's called a sensitivity analysis. But G Power can do it too. So we've already talked about Cohen C, right? That's before the computer got started. Cohen C is a formula that you take the two sample averages and subtract them on the top and divide by the pooled standard deviation. That little P on the S means pooled standard deviation. It is interesting. Math is beautiful and glorious. And you can do algebraic rearranging. This other formula right here with the T, this is the T score. And what are these little N's with the ones and twos? Sample the two size. sample sizes. If you put your sample sizes in the test statistic here, you will get the same numbers as if you put the averages in the pool standard deviation here. So sometimes people publish their results and their p-values without effect sizes. It's a no-no. If they do, as long as they tell you your sample sizes in the t-statistic, you can make, you know, do your own number crunching to find out what Cohen's d was. But starting now, anytime you give a test statistic and a p-value, it should be followed by a effect size, which if it's a two-sample p-test, it better be a Cohen's d. So as, every time we learn a new kind of test, we're going to learn what effect size should go with it. Okay. Now this one right here, see this little N, like a little curly down? That's eta, the lowercase eta. That's eta squared. Eta squared is another kind of effect size. And then we have this R squared PD. Anyone know what that is? R squared? What's R? In the red chapter 9, right? Not yet? No. That's number not this one. Do Monday, okay. R is correlation. So R squared is the squared correlation, it's coefficient of determination. PB is point by serial correlation. So this is if you have a continuous variable and a categorical variable, like grouping variables. So if you have two groups, the eta squared and the D are the same. But if you have more than three groups, like ANOVA, this is a little different. The formula is a little different. We'll worry about that when we get there. But just so show you. Eta is ADA? Hmm? Eta? ABA? ETA. ETA. Oh. Et oh, okay. ETA. ETA. Yeah, sorry. ETA. I have an Idaho accent. ETA. ETA. Yeah. All right. So these are some pictures that some people find helpful. These tend to confuse me more than anything, so I'm not going to really look at them. <laughs> okay. So Cohen C, there's the same formula on the last slide. Cohen, you know, people want rules of thumb. What's a big effect? What's a small effect? I hate rules of thumb, but I'm teaching you to them because they're used commonly. This does not say not important, very important, okay? It's not earth shattering and ignorable. Those are not the labels. It's small, moderate, and large, and I don't even like those labels. But these are some cutoffs to help guide when you talk about effect sizes. If an effect Cohen's D is one, that means the group's averages are one standard deviation apart. Usually, if their averages are more than one standard deviation apart, you're probably not going to be studying it because it's going to be something that's obvious. It's not going to be like, I wonder, it'll be like that. Like, if I was studying, do seatbelts reduce medical costs for a car crash? using seatbelts and I have a group that was wearing seatbelts and a group that was not. Do 
you think I need to do a test to see if that's true? That the two groups would have different medical costs after the accident. The eyeball test would probably do. The eyeball test would probably do. If the eyeball test would probably do, then the Cohen C is probably like two or three. So you're not going to very often see Cohen C bigger than one. They will happen, but not very often. So Cohen C here, there's no dec zero in front of these decimals, but there should be, because Cohen's D can be one point something, it could be two point something. So I'm going to go change that slide. I'm trying to redo these slides right now, but I'm trying to do your assignments first. So if your Cohen's D is about 0 0.2, it's a smallish effect size. What if your Cohen's D comes out to be 0.47? Moderate. Moderate. What if your Cohen's D is 0.68? That's like the setting on your uh, brain being low. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it is not going to be one of these three. It is more often than not going to fall in there. So you can say moderately small or moderately large. I mean, this is just some labeling that you can incorporate, language you can incorporate. It's not going to be one clearly above the other more often than not. It's usually going to fall between those. But you can say moderately strong instead of just saying small. That's why we give the number, not just the name, the word. Okay, so A to square, just because it's going to come up, is about association, because chapter 9 is about the association between two variables. A to square always ranges between 0 and 1. What does that tell us about the, in front of the decimal? Nothing. So in A to square, there's nothing in front of the decimal, but Cohen's D, there needs to be something in front of the decimal. Um, with only two groups, A to squared and Cohen's D are both the same number. But how could that be possible if Cohen's D could be above one? Oh, the with two groups, the point by serial correlation is the same as A to squared. Sorry, not Cohen's D. The point by serial cor correlation. Both of those are effect sizes. We'll get those in a minute. Okay. So what things affect? Sample size. Here are the ingredients or the things that affect your power. Your power. So one is the sample size, and that's the, usually the biggest variable when you're doing research is how big should our sample be? Before we do research, that's always the big question that people come to me about. How many people should I get in my sample? This is effect size is the thing that I can't answer. My answer is always it depends. How big do you think the effect's gonna be? If it's a big effect, maybe you only need two people. Because if it's a big effect, it's going to be obvious, and a small sample will do. But if it only makes a little bit of a difference, you need a lot more people to be able to distinguish that they are different. This effect size is the most problematic thing, not because the math is hard, it's because that's why we're doing research. Right? If you knew how big of an effect something had, would you want to study it? No. So how do you know what effect size you should use in your power analysis? Your statistician does not know to help you. You have to go to your literature, to the journals and publications of hopefully that exact variable on those exact people under those exact conditions. But probably not. It'll probably be similar variables measured on similar people under similar conditions. And what would be an exciting number? If I was studying second graders learning to read, this is false. Sorry, judge don't like reading second graders. But and I'm counting words per minute. That's an important thing that they look at it for second graders to know whether or not they're becoming literate or if they're at risk and need some extra help. They look at how many words they read correctly per minute. If I have a new intervention and it changes that one word a minute, is that going to be exciting? Probably not. What if it helps kids read 20 more words per minute? I'll tell you the average is in the 50 to 100. So if I can increase it by 20, that's a big deal. So what's an important effect size or a noticeable effect size is what is pra of practical importance. And that is completely dependent on who and what you're studying. Um, sometimes in education, we get excited about effect sizes that are very, very small. 
Sometimes we, in psychology, it's not exciting to have to be really big to be excited. It just depends. These last two are pretty easy. Alpha, what are we always going to set our alpha at? 0.05, unless we have more reason. Almost never have. And directionality, how many tails? We're usually going to go with two. One is more powerful, but people think that you're poking around if you only do one, unless you're like doing a replication step, which we did on the cortex one. So there is a table in your book, I think it's A3, and a formula for the non-centrality parameter delta, but we're not going to do that so much. We're going to use G power. Okay? okay? So before I turn on G power and we figure out how to use it, and we'll pretty much do the entire assignment, because why not? So things. D, Cohen's D, means how many standard deviations apart are the two means in the population. We call it Cohen's D when we use the sample numbers, but really we should be calling it Hedges G. Because Cohen said effect size is how big it would be in this population, but nobody has population data, we're just using the sample data, and so it really should be called Hedges G, but people are used to calling it Cohen's D, so they just Call it D, even though it's really G. Um, okay. That's the biggest thing in there. So let's go. To, oh, the mouse doesn't work. Okay. So, G power. Now, G power is free. Yay! It works on Windows. Yay! It works on Mac. Yay! I cannot make it bigger on my screen. There's no way to zoom it. Now, if you have a Mac, Macs, a lot of Macs, at, especially the smaller ones, your default screen resolution, resolution is going to cut off the bottom of this window. Do you guys have that? Do you, you have Mac? No? no? So, two Macs. If that's the case, you need to change your screen resolution because you've got to be able to push this calculate button at the bottom. And you can't move it up without losing stuff. And so that's the only thing I've ran into with Macs is that if you have a small screen in the resolution, you might lose the bottom of that window. So it's tiny. You would think, where would you think to start on a program? What part of the window? Probably think you should start at the top, right? No, we start in the middle with G power. So this top part will display either a plot or protocol, like list it out, really good thing to put in the grant, or a proposal, all of you that are going to be doing a proposal at some point. We're going to start in the middle, though. There are three drop downs in the middle. The first is the height, the test family. We What kind of tests have we learned so far? C and T, a little bit of X, a little bit of F, but not really. Okay. And then what kind of statistical test? And then the third one is the type of power analysis. So let's do the first one on the homework. It says the SAT scores for men and women were 510 and 490. What is Cohen C? Oh, really, that one doesn't do better. Sorry. It's what number? Um, chapter 8, section B, number 6 is what number on your homework? Four. I think it's four. Four. Okay, so it's the drug for treating headaches. Yeah, I get headaches. Fat has a side effect of lowering diastolic blood pressure by eight millimeters of mercury compared to the placebo. So we're supposed, and then it says the if the population standard deviation is known to be six millimeters of mercury, and then we're supposed to do a power analysis. So what kind of test are we gonna do there? What, what is, how many groups do we have? Two groups, because we have a drug group and a placebo group. So we have two groups. And um, part A, what are we supposed to find? Power and part A tells us, to, asks us to find the power of an experiment that has alpha of 0.01. How many tails? Two. Two tails, comparing the drug to placebo using 15 participants per group. So it gives us sample size of 15, alpha 0.01. We're going to go power of 
0.8 or 80 percent unless they say otherwise and it says two tails and we're supposed to find or wait no we're supposed to find power on that one right yeah yeah so we're so to be okay so first we've got to find what family test family are we going to do two groups we're comparing the averages it's going to be a t-test but it's not going to be correlation point by serial model which one are we going to go with you can drop down the list Means, the difference between means, we're doing means, difference between two independent groups. With not the matched pairs, we haven't learned about those yet. That would be a pre-test, post-test, married couples, parent-child, something where they're matched together. We're doing independent groups, two groups. It makes it, your power analysis completely depends on picking the right test. You cannot do a power analysis for correlation and then hope you're going to have enough to do a regression analysis. It does not work that way. They're not interchangeable. So you got to know what you know and what you want to do. So we want to do uh, compare means to see the difference between two independent groups, treatment of placebo. So the type of power analysis, we're going to leave it on the no, we're not going to leave it on the first one. The first one is the most common, though. The first one, and you can drop down the list, the a priori, so this is before you do an analysis, before you gather your data, you want to compute the sample size you're going to need. That's the most common use of a power analysis, is to see how big your sample should be based on all the other things. But this time, the question is asking us to compute power. power. So it's post hoc. So it's like after we did the experiment, what was our power? So first thing you got to do is go into that middle chunk and get those three drop downs to the right settings. Then on the left side, you're going to put in the inputs. When you press, press the calculate, it's going to fill out the outputs. And the last one's going to be the thing we need, power. Okay, so inputs. The very first input is tails. How many tails? It defaults to one. I, it, it, I don't know why it does that. I have, there's a couple defaults on here that I think are not what I would have said. I would always do two. Now effect size. Because we said means, it says effect size D. This is Cohen's D. Now notice my cursor is hovering over that box and it gives us, have you seen those before? Can you see them even at all on the screen? Mm -hmm. 0 0.2, 0 0.5, 0 0.8. Those are Cohen's rule of thumb cutoffs. Max, it's really hard to get that to hover and give it to you. PCs tend to give, make that appear easier. Can you guys, is yours hovering? Windows. Oh, you're doing it on the Windows side? Yeah. Um, so it's got 0.5, but in ours, is it? Are we supposed to put Cohen's D of 0.5? No. We have to calculate it. Now, did it tell us the average of the drug group? No. Did it tell us the average of the placebo group? No. But it already has subtracted them because what was the very first number they gave us? The difference between the two was eight. And then we're going to divide by what's the standard deviation? They told it to us. Six. Eight divided by six is 1.33. Now, to make things easy, always use four numbers until you go to copy computer output and then do two. Okay? Except for our p value should be three. We'll just go with those four. Okay. Alpha, error probability, 0.05. Are we okay with that default? Oh, this question told us to do 0.01. And sample size of group one and sample size of group two. They said they had 15 per group. Okay, once you get all your inputs set, push calculate. Okay, 
here's that delta non-centrality parameter, and they're looking it up in the table, and you don't have to do all that. It's not nice. G power is why we use this comes from, I think you notice a Dutch um, university's page. It is used, I've used it in every grant I've ever written or been on. It is hands down used by everyone. If you use G power, you're fine. There is other software like you can pay for and use. There are some things in R, but it's so prevalently used they decided let's teach it. Okay, so what would we say our power is? 0.8. Go two decimal places. Copy things off software two decimal places. Point eight zero. Should we have a number something in front of the decimal? Yes. yes. No. Can power be one point something? No. Power is always going to be start with the decimal. So just decimal eight zero. It defaults. So. On yeah, Canvas I will, know that. Canvas will put the zero in and it'll cut Canvis off. Canvas will put the zero in and it'll cut, cut off, off the, the trailing zero. zero. Yeah, I'm going to fix it. Okay. That'll, start, starting in chapter 11, that will be, it will take, it'll take what you type in and won't like throw off trailing zeros and add zeros up front and then you win. Okay, good. Part B. Now it says, how many participants would you need per group to obtain 95% power with alpha equal 0.01 and two tails. So what do we need to change? The type of power analysis. We're still doing the same test, but now instead of doing post hoc, we're going to do a priori. So two tails, correct or incorrect? Correct. Cohen's D, 1.3333, yeah? Um, alpha, 0.01, yeah? Yes, it said on this one. Power, 0.95. Actually, yes. You know what, it defaults to power 0.95, but what are we almost always gonna want? Power of 0 0.80. That's one of, another one of the defaults that I don't understand on this program. And the last thing is allocation ratio. So if we have two groups, I will tell you, the most powerful design is if the two groups are the same size. Most powerful if they're the same size. So what ratio would that be? One for you, one for me. One for you, one for me. It's a ratio of one to one or just the number one. So that's what the default is. That's the most powerful design. If you can get away with it, I would plan that. Now, if you plan to have equal size groups, do you think you'll end up with equal size groups? What if I get 10 and 10 in my study? By the end, it's going to be? Seven and eight. Seven and eight. <laughs> we plan. <laughs> the key here is the allocation ratio for planning. Now, um, sometimes that's not feasible. Right now, I'm on a grant. It's going out Monday. I just finished my bio sketch for an NIH um, R21. I'm very excited about it. And it's about kids with autism. Kids with autism in Cache Valley compared to typical developing kids. Ratio there. Do you think it's a one to one equal size groups? So a lot easier to get typical developing groups than it is autistic kids. So we're doing a two to one ratio. We're getting two typical developing for every one autistic because we plan to do some matching for another sub analysis. So sometimes you want a different number there if you're in one of those scenarios, but we're not. So we can just push calculate. Now, the only thing here is what did they ask for? Sample size per group or total sample size? Because it gives us both here. Per group. Per group. They want them per group. So what are you going to type into Canvas? 22. If you're, you ever use the formula, what are you going to do with sample size if you get a number that's a decimal? Uh, round up. Always round up. Do the ceiling. Always round up. Always. Even if it's 0 0.01. Always round it up. Okay. Do you guys, let's see, do you want to bang out the last few? I think we did. Go fast? They are really fast. They are very it's fast. The just it's all the same. So, what are we doing? Uh, you're changing the 0.05 and then you're changing your. Uh, What's 0.05? Oh, yeah, yeah, your. Um, alpha? Yeah. Alpha to 0.05. And then your effect size needs to go to 0.2. Effect size, size, it says it's a small effect. So, we're going to put in 0.2. 
Power should be 0.8. Power should be 0.8. Does it say anything about allocation ratio? No. It so equal it says equal size sample sizes. So that's the one. So compute. So the answer to part A is 394 for each because it says what's the sample size for each gender. So that's part A said was for small effect size. The only thing you're changing here on out is the effect. So you're going medium and then large. So if I make it a so if I want to be able to detect differences that are very minute, I'm going to need fairly big sample size. What if I only want to detect moderate effect sizes? What's going to happen to the required sample size? Does it get, get bigger or smaller? Sometimes this is counterintuitive when you first start doing it. You think bigger, sam bigger effect should be bigger sample. But if we want a moderate effect size, now our two groups need to each have sample size 64. And what if we only want to find a ginormous, a very large effect size of 0.8? Now only 26. Now these sample sizes only apply to the two-tailed alpha 0.05 two sample independent groups t-tests. That does not apply if you want to do an SEM or you want to do a CFA or any other kind of analysis. I stress that because people get confused with that and they think, oh, 26 should always be good enough. No, no. I had someone say, well, isn't a sample size of 30 good all the time? No, no, it's not. So, uh, yeah. Before uh, we did this, I, mm -hmm. I had calculated the steps beforehand. And they're going to be slightly different. They were different. Yeah. And I, for the first, for number six, about not this one, but the headache one, I've done them by hand, and you get something a little bit different. Oh, for these down here? Uh, yeah, the. Oh, I don't have the hand calculations down here. Yeah, if you do the hand calculations, it's a little bit different. One, because of rounding error. Two, because the table doesn't always have the exact values, and you have to use you know, the closest one. So G power is less time intensive, and it is acceptable most everywhere I've ever seen. So that's why I'm not going to take the time to show you this. I, I didn't even know that table existed until I taught out of this book. I would never learned to use the table. I just always used the formulas and the G power. So will we be doing that in the test? In the test. I'm not going to have you do these by hand. They might be, if I want to detect a small, if I'm trying to detect, detect an effect size that's small and large, which one would take a bigger sample size? Smaller effect size would take a bigger sample size. There'll be more like understanding questions because you can't open G power and I'm not teaching you the equation, so I'm not gonna have you hand calculate that on the test. Now there are curves that they follow. It's not like if I half the sample size, that doesn't mean I need to double the effect size. It's not that, because there's square roots and stuff involved. So you think you can get this assignment done by tonight? The only ones we didn't do really were the multiple choice. They came out of the book. Are those, did they have answers in the back of the book? One of them does. The second one does. Can you talk about the extremely large T-value one? I just want to make sure I understand. Okay, so that's the, the second one on the homework assignment. So on the homework number, current homework numbering is number two. It's number A9 in the textbook. And it says a T value was calculated for a particular two-group experiment was negative 23. What do you guys think about a T value of negative 23? That's huge. That's huge. That means that those two groups have averages that are very, very different compared to how do we calculate a T score there? We subtract. Let's see. So we, yeah, to do a T, we would subtract our averages and divide by the standard deviation over square root. No, it's the pooled. It's two sample. So it's the standard error, right? 
So how we make that standard error with the two standard deviations and the two sample sizes depending differently depending on if they're homo, homo, homogeneity of variance, if the spreads are the same, and if they're balanced, if the ends are the same. But these are the ingredients that go into the standard error. So if this comes out to be negative 23, that means these two group averages are very different in terms of number of standard errors apart that they are. So let's, let's go through A through E, because there's only one true one. So A says, a calculation error must have been made. Now, that's possible, but is it guaranteed that's the only reason? No. So even though A could have been the reason we got such a big T value, it's not like a guarantee. B, the number of participants must have been large. It can be, but it doesn't It could have been, but it doesn't have to be. A large sample size is likely to make it be in more bigger, but not guaranteed. C, the effect size must have been large. Not really because because for the same reason that we cannot say that the, you know, the sample size is large. For this to come out to be negative 23, one way would be if the averages are 23 apart and the standard e error is 1. That would be averages way apart, with the small standard error. But it, if those two averages, could they be really close together and come out with a t-score of negative 23? Yeah, if the spreads are small and the sample sizes are big. So C is possible, but is not required. So A, B, and C could all cause you to have a big T value, but n none of them are required to get a big T value. That's why this one's kind of a confusing one, so I'm glad you asked about it. D, the expected T was probably large. So expected T, I didn't talk about in the lecture, but expected T is what that delta is, and that's correct. So D is the answer. A says the alpha level was probably large. Does alpha have anything to do with calculating T? No, alpha has to do with well, how you interpret it. If we interpret the p-value to be significant or not. It's just the interpretation. So alpha is not in that calculation at all. So the correct answer on there is D, even though I didn't talk about expected T. If you look at the page 243 of the book, the interpretation of t value. Yeah. Your t should come out close to delta. Delta is the non centrality parameter. But I have a hard time like wrapping my brain around it sometimes. It has to do with those figures. So so that's why we just go to you can understand the relationship. If you have bigger sample size, you have more power. Then that's good enough for me. Okay. All right. Should we jump into chapter nine? Yeah. And the slides that you said aren't working. So we can go to Tyson's page. The, oh, that's not what I wanted. Okay, so I'll go to his site just to get, I'll make, I'll get it working tonight. Statistical Foundations, Chapter 9. He, um, Tyson tried rearranging the chapters last semester and he wasn't really thrilled with it. So we're going to go back to the order that they're in the book. Okay, so correlation. So sometimes we want to compare groups. <clears throat> that was what the t-tests were about, our, our, Mac, our independent groups t-tests comparing groups. Sometimes instead of having two, the same variable measured on two different groups, instead we have two variables on each person. So we don't have groups, we just have multiple variables. Like we might have height and weight measured on each person. Or we might have um, attention and math score on each person. We'll have two scores on each person, or measurements of some kind. And we want to know, are those things associated with each other? So that's chapter nine. Is the, the key is looking at, are two things associated or not associated, or how strongly they're associated? 
So the motivating example here, and Dr. Mortimer is interested in knowing whether people have a positive view of themselves <laughs> in one aspect of their lives. In one aspect of their lives, it, if those people also tend to have a positive view of themselves in other aspects of their life. So we have one group of people, what are the two things we're gonna measure? Positive aspect, how positive they are in, in area A, and how positive they are in area B, and see if those are associated or correlated. We have 80 men who complete a self-concept inventory that contains five scales. Four scales involve questions about how competent respondents feel in areas of intimate relationships, relationships with friends, common sense, reasoning, and everyday knowledge. So that's one line. How good they feel there. And then we also have academic reasoning and scholarly knowledge. So we have these two areas. He asked about, or he asked about all these areas, and then the fifth one is how they feel in general. So, oh, that's more than five. Four scales. Five scales total. Total. Four in here, and then a fifth one. So he doesn't just have A and B, he has A, B, C, D, E. So how many different ways can you pair those together? You could have A with B, A with C, A with D. You could have correlations or associations are done pairwise. So you have two variables at a time. So if you have five variables, you can actually have come up with ten ways to pair them together. Block, isn't it? So we usually make a matrix out of it. Everyone, anyone seen a correlation matrix? Yeah. Okay, so correlation. This is when we're interested in the degree or how much two things are associated or co-relate. Now, it's important, those measurements have to be on the same unit, same person, same animal, same school, whatever it is we're studying. Um, we're not looking at group differences we just want to know, are they associated? Now, usually we use the word correlation if we have an ordinal or a numeric, a continuous variable. We usually use the word association or dependence if we're looking at not ordered things like race or um, gender, because those things don't have order. So correlation is usually when we have, our measurement is a ordinal or continuous scale. If we looked at like, country of origin or county or any of those things would usually work, use the word association and dependence instead of saying correlation. But it's the same idea. Do they co-occur? Okay. So do they co-occur, yes or no, and how strongly do they? Um, the process of calculating correlation standardizes or gets rid of the units because we don't want the units to be um, involved in the computation. So if I do measure temperature measurements, I want to know does temperature correlate with air pollution and measure it in, how do they measure air pollution? Parts, parts per million? Per yeah. So parts per million and if I do it in self degrees Celsius, I want to get the same answer if I do degrees Fahrenheit. I don't want the correlation to depend on the units I use. So is it millimeters or is it parts per thousand, parts per million? I want it to be unit dependent, so we're going to standardize. And we're going to test the idea, is the correlation zero? Zero would be no correlation. Okay, so here's some data. I feel like I'm falling asleep in here because it's too dark. So it's a little better. Um, so this is over time, here's some data, it has for each of these years the number of films, movie films, that Nicolas Cage was in, so any Nicolas Cage fans, uh, versus, and that's the black dots, and the red dots are number of people who grounded by falling in a pool. <laughs> Correlated. Correlated? <laughs> what do you notice? What about 2003? Nicholas was only in one film, and there were very few groundings. Oh, what about 2007? He had four oh. films, and a lot of people died. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Ridiculous correlation. Yeah. <laughs> well, it is true. This is true data. But it's not an important correlation. Oh, 
So are these things correlated? Yeah. Yes. Is it causal? Highly doubtable. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that the reason that I what's the reason that I put this up here? Because <clears throat> it makes your point well. The, what is the point? <laughs> that just because it's correlated doesn't mean it's correlated. Just because things are correlated together does not mean that they cause each other, especially in what kind of data? What kind of study? Observational research. If this was experimental data, and we we made these people each year watch those films, maybe we could spend, you know, make a causal, um, yeah. So the way that we're going to graphically look at this kind of data is we're going to make scatter plots. So this is a new kind of plot in R for us, right? So you have two variables measured on each person. So we're going to make a point for each person or mouse or whatever it is we're studying. Who studies pigeons? I someone study pigeons from here. So you put one variable on the x-axis, one variable on the y-axis, and you take their numbers and find where they join and you put a point. You get a bunch of points. If you can squint your lines, I squint your eyes and see a line, then it, a linear association. And second important point, Correlation as measured by R, Pearson's correlation coefficient, or Pearson's product moment correlation coefficient, only measures how tightly the points fit a straight line, a linear association. So it's very, very important to plot your data to see, do the points make a rough line? What if you plot your points and you get a rainbow? What would be two variables that when you plotted it, you might get a rainbow? Rainfall in a month. Let's month. rainfall in a month year in a year. Rainfall and we do the months from January to or precipitation, we might get a U. A lot in January in Utah, at least we get a lot of snowfall and it dries up in the summer and then a lot more by the time we get to December. What about age? What's something that goes up and then down or down and then up across age? Mobility. Mobility. Your mobility increases, and then at some point it goes down. Health. Um, there's all kinds of things that would have relationships that are not linear. Linear does not mean it's right or good. It just means it's linear. So we always want to plot our data to see if it's linear. So this is how we do it. Let's see. Big surprise. What do we start with? The name of our data set. We're using DF to stand for data frame. We're going to use ggplot. But instead of, in the aesthetic, before we've only had to put one variable, now we have to put both variables. And the order you put them, the first one makes the x-axis, the second one makes the y-axis, it's alphabetical. And then we say geom underscore point. Guess what this part does? We put the dots. And if you want to draw the best fitting line, you say geom smooth. And then in the parentheses, if you just say GM smooth with empty parentheses, it does a smoother line. A moving average smoother is called the lowest line. We want the linear line model. They're the linear line. So we say method equals LM, standard error equals false. Because if, if you don't put standard error equals false, it'll put some bands on that, which are fine sometimes, but it's not always possible. So that's how you can make a picture of a scatter plot in R. So what do you think about those data? Are the variables x and y correlated in that sample? Yeah, there's some relationship, right? What would you say? As x gets bigger, y gets bigger too. High values of x are paired with high values of y. Low values of x are paired with low values of y. When low goes with low and high goes with high, we call this a positive correlation. Because going from left to right, it gets bigger. Because we read a book in English from left to right. And so getting bigger is positive because we want to be bigger. I don't know. Some way to remember it. OK, so positive is going up. Negative is going down when you're reading left to right. Now, no data is going to make a perfect line unless you're measuring 
doing two variables that are same length. Temperature in degrees Celsius and temperature in degrees Fahrenheit at the same time. Those are perfectly correlated. Other than that, there's going to be a data cloud. You got to squint your eyes and kind of try to figure out which way it would be going. Sometimes it's harder, sometimes it's easier. Positive, negative. Strength. Strength is how strongly the relationship, how tight the lines are, the points are around the line. So here would be if we're doing Celsius and Fahrenheit at the same time points. Perfect. This is a correlation where R equals. 1.0, positive 1.0 is perfect. You can't get any more straight than that. What about this correlation? Not strong. Not strong, but weak would be if it was like a total ball. It'd be like no correlation. This would maybe be moderate correlation. So maybe this is like 0.5. If it's complete data cloud that you cannot even tell if it would be going up or down at all, that's correlation. Zero. So what would correlation of negative one equal? It's perfect line going down. Doesn't have to be 45 degrees, just a perfect line. Okay. So let's see. This one, what do you say about these points? On this top panel? Positively correlated, moderately positively correlated. Okay, let's look down here underneath this first one. What would you say about this relationship? It's your U. Oh, we have a U. If we were to do Pearson's R, Pearson's R on this ends up being almost zero. Because where's the line of best fit here? Like one line. It's going to do it like flat. How well is that going to fit the data? If you did a diagonal line, can you make a diagonal line fit the data better? Probably not. So Pearson's R ends up being zero here. But is there an association? Yes. Yes, it's just non-linear. Okay. So Pearson's R is only good for detecting linear relationships. It does not capture non-linear relationships. Okay. What about this one at the top here? Zero. Zero. This is a good one because is it going up or down? Can you even make out one or the other? Squint your eyes. No, nope. this is a completely random. This would be correlation R equals zero, no relationship. Okay, here's a tricky one. What's this one? What would R be? It's still going to be zero. R measures the strength of relationship between X and Y. Does knowing what X is here change or give us information about what y is? If x is low, y is 5. If x is high, y is 5. x provides no information about y because there's no variability in y. So this is straight flat line is correlation of 0. So correlation 0, correlation 0, correlation 0. R. At least all three of these would have R equals zero. So just knowing what R is doesn't tell you what the picture will look like. So that's why it's important to plot your data. Because if you just calculate the number that R is, you might miss something important. Like knowing there's no variability or a nonlinear trend. Okay. Is We're not, zero, sorry, yeah. is zero also just called non-relational? Like no, rela no relation. No relation. Yeah. Okay. All right. Here are four scatter plots. Okay, I want you to compare them. I want you to pick the one that has the highest correlation. Which one is going to have R be closer to perfect 1.0? Which one? Uh, the very this one? Yeah. Who wants to put some money on it? <laughs> Which one looks the best? Yeah. Yeah, what I were you going to say the first one? Well, why would you pick the first one? Yeah. Uh, because they're so tightly grouped. They are very tightly grouped. But what maybe not so great about this plot? There is no correlation after a cartoon. Yeah, there's all this wasted space, right? 
These are the same data. Oh, the, the, on purpose, the axis numbers are really small. Those are all identical data. Which one does R make by default DB? It's really good. This is the one that R will make by default. You have to force it to do these because it wants to use your space appropriately. It's not wasted any X space in either direction. It's kind of zoomed in the best that it can. And it makes, by default, R will make a plot that's the golden ratio. Have you ever heard the golden ratio? Yes. That it's just a little bit more than what, twice as wide as it is high, or almost twice as wide as it is high? So that's just the defaults that are built in. Okay. Another thing that calculating R, the correlation coefficient, will not tell you is if you have outliers. So when we said describe the distribution when we were looking at one variable at a time, remember we made a histogram and we said the center, the spread, the shape, and if there were any outliers. When we look at a distribution with two variables, we call this a bivariable relationship. We want to know is it positive, negative, strong, weak, and are there any outliers or influential points? So in this one, it has one point way out here. This one has a point way out there. One's an outlier. One's influential. So the first one. Okay, uh, to show this, I want to go to this app. This is the last thing we'll do because we only have five minutes left. I like this app. This is a good app. And this app came with the textbook I used to teach math or stat 1040 in. Okay, this is an app where you can make some points. Okay, I have two points. What's the correlation? Perfect 1.0. Why is the correlation perfect 1.0? Because you can draw a perfect line through that data. Okay, let me put some more data points on. Okay. What's going to happen if I put a point, let's see, let's put one right down in this bottom left-hand corner. What's going to happen if I put a point down there? It will be an outlier because it will be farther on the x-axis and farther on the y-axis than the rest of the data. But do you think, what do you think it's going to do if I put a point down here? What's going to happen to our correlation number 0.7? It will go up. Increase. Oh, yeah, it's increase. I increase? I increase it because it'll still be linear. I think it'll be close to what it is now. You think it's going to stay close to the same? Yeah, you think it's going to change? You think it's going to get bigger? Just a little bit bigger. Anyone think it's going to get smaller? It depends like where exactly. Uh, it does depend exactly. <laughs> I'm going to put it in, as far in that corner as I possibly can. Ready? I'm going to use my pen so I can be exact. Okay. Ready, set, go. Oh, higher. Because it's more of a straight line. It makes the line more, like if you were trying to draw a line through here, would you know exactly where to go? This like a point down here, like anchors that line. Now what would happen if I took this point and dragged it up to the, straight up to the top? What's gonna get a lot smaller? The correlations get smaller, why? It's not the line anymore, now you have two Okay, how bad do you think it's gonna get? You think it's going to be point two? Let's see. You ready? Come on. Come on. Okay. Is it gonna? Oh, I have to. Wow. <laughs> How much did it change the correlation? <laughs> Done. Okay. We talked about some quantity calculation, some number before that was very influenced by outliers. What things were influenced by outliers? Mean. The mean, standard the standard deviation. What about correlation? Is it influenced by outliers? Yes. yes. This is another reason why you must plot your data. If you calculate R, is it going to tell you the whole story if you have an outlier? If your outlier's down here, it's in the line, it's going to make R look stronger than it really is. If your outlier is up there, it's an influential point. It's, it's influencing the correlation and making R look less strong or even the opposite direction than the bulk of the point. 
R is not full foolproof. R correlation coefficient, that number, you must plot your data. This has really bitten people a lot in the past. Don't let it bite you. Plot your data. I mean, how much code was it in R? Three lines. Is there any excuse? No. <laughs> Don't be lazy. Plot your data. Okay. Um, now, we're going to, we only have like two minutes left. I don't want to do a lot more, but here I'm going to show, I'm going to get rid of that point. No, get rid of it. The next one we're going to, next chapter we're going to do is regression. Here is the regression line. So this is the line of best fit. So what's going to happen, what's going to happen to the regression line if I put a point here? The angle Not much. Not much. The angle might change a little bit. Let's see. What's going to happen if I put the point up in the top? So correlation, here's some are, and regression are both very susceptible to influence by outliers. Influential points are a big deal. So for correlation and regression, what are you going to make sure you do? Plot, plot, plot your data. data. And how are you going to plot data where you have two measurements on the same person? What's that called? Scatter plot. Scatter, scatter plot. Because the points look like they've been scattered, like you threw jacks down on the floor. Nobody plays jacks for all older than that. I'm even older than that. <laughs> okay. This is a fun app to play with. What do you think is going to happen if I add 20 more points? All in that same area. Now what happens when I put a point there? What happens with I? Oh, man. Oh, did it change as much as when I only had 20 points? Let me put in some more points. Is that because it's weighted differently? Yeah, because of the weight. If you have a hundred points over here, almost a hundred, and only one out there, it doesn't have as it can't influence as, as much. So the smaller your sample size, the more one outlier can throw things off. If you have a big sample size, you probably need a couple outliers. But again, it depends on how far they are. What if my outlier was just like right here? So there is no and your, cutoff. Well, your sample size might spread it out to, to where the, it's not really an outlier. Yes. It's How do you know if you don't plot it? <laughs> you can't know. Plot your data, plot your data, plot your data. Okay. So that, that's my main lessons about correlation. Plot your data. <laughs> because if R, R doesn't tell you the whole story, if it's no variability, curve trend, Outliers, they can influence your correlation and your regression, and you won't even know it if you haven't plotted. So you got chapter eight pretty much almost done. And you, you know, chapter nine, at least we're ready so that on, do we have class on Monday? No. Nope. So on Wednesday, we can finish the regression, the correlation chapter and the regression chapter. And then we'll be ready for a week from Monday to take next test. Ah, that was not a happy. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's like, yay, yay, I'm yay. so excited. <laughs> we all love tests so much. Yeah. But you can take it at home in your jammies with your, your favorite beverage and a snack, so it's not that bad. I have to come to my office or my kids will be tested. Me too. <laughs> so, so next Monday we'll take, not, not this coming Monday, Monday, but a week from Monday we'll take the test. And I will be here in the room to Q&A if you want to wait to take the test after okay. class, but if you feel comfortable, you're welcome to take it early. I will send an email or an, an announcement out saying it's ready to go, so like a day or two well, ahead of time. I have not done that yet, so don't try to take it. Well, no, I'm, I'm, no, <laughs> I, that, my, my, you want my to plan would be to take it like on Saturday or Sunday yeah. just because... I'll try to get it. I'll try to have it a week early, or at least four or five days early. Do you have a question? No. Okay. You can go.
Oh, go home. Go home. Yeah, me too. I'm going to stop the recording. I hope it got the um, 